Is Uprising, I'm your host, Sonali Kohatkar. Al Bornstein was born in 1948 into a conservative Jewish East Coast family, went to college at the prestigious Brown University, graduated in 1969, and in the summer of 1970, stumbled onto a Scientology center in Denver, Colorado. There, Bornstein began taking classes and was swiftly recruited into the Scientologists' elite sailing crew, the Sea Org. Al signed a billion-year contract to serve the organization along with a woman who would be his first wife and the mother of his only child, a daughter they named Jessica. Twelve years later, Al was excommunicated from the church and shortly thereafter gave in to a lifelong desire and began transitioning to living life as a woman named Kate. Catherine Van Dam Bornstein lived much of her life on the fringes of society. She felt uncomfortable living life as a male since the age of four. The feeling was not extinguished by her father, a proud and self-proclaimed male chauvinist pig, quote-unquote. So concerned with his son's masculinity, he forced the teenage Al into a rendezvous with a prostitute. Kate continued to harbor fantasies of being a woman during the years she lived as a rising male heterosexual star with the Church of Scientology, which did not condone alternative sexual or gender identities. After being forced from the structured and cloistered life of a full-time Scientologist in 1982, Bornstein began anew, eventually changing her name, her body, and her entire social circle. She moved to Seattle, spent a lot of time in therapy, got tattoos, dreamed of being a star, and advocated for others like herself. A pioneer in raising awareness of the transgender community, Kate Bornstein authored the groundbreaking 1994 book Gender Outlaw on men, women, and the rest of us, followed by a number of acclaimed books that challenge the traditional belief that there are only two genders, male or female. Her newest work is A Queer and Pleasant Danger, a no-holds-barred memoir, and an open letter to her estranged daughter and grandchildren. Kate Bornstein now joins me in studio. Welcome to Uprising. Thank you, and thank you for such a lovely summary. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to read this, the subtitle of your book, uh, Queer and Pleasant Danger. It's a true story of a nice Jewish boy who joins the Church of Scientology and leaves 12, leaves 12 years later to become the lovely lady she is today. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, in I suppose. In a nutshell, that's <laughs> it, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the Church of Scientology. Um, uh, and, and, of course, I want to talk to you also about the way in which the church views gender roles. But first, what was it that drew you into the church? And was it typical of the kind of folks that get drawn to the church? Um, in, in your book, you seem to be at a place in your life where you were looking for somebody to accept uh, you or to give you a, a kind of meaning in your life. Is that Was that the sort of thing that drew you? I joined the Church of Scientology in 1970. And and there was a bumper crop of hippie boys and hippie girls who joined it around that time. Um, the hippie movement was sort of flaking out, and we all wanted to change the world. But what drew me into Scientology is their belief, one that I already knew from uh, Zen Buddhism that I'd been studying, uh, that you're an immortal being, and you've lived countless past lives as both a man and a woman. And I went, Really? So does that mean me as an immortal being, am I male or female? No, they laughed. No, immortal beings have no gender. Gender is for bodies. And that sold me on it, but... They because of your own sort of internal questions yeah, about your own identity. <laughs> that made sense. It made sense that, okay, I'm an immortal soul. My body is a temple for my spirit. Okay, cool. Um, but they don't act like that because if you're homosexual or you, you, you express an alternative gender, uh, they label you as evil. Their word for evil is suppressive person. So there's this sort of uh, then contradictory nature of the Church of Scientology on the issue of gender. On the one hand, they believe that there are these beings called Thetans. Thetans, yes. And, yep. and, and Thetans don't have a specific gender. But then if your body, if your human body it doesn't fit into the male-female categories, you are a suppressive person. Correct. And this is a question I've never gotten answered from them, and I've been asking for them to reply for, to me on, on, you know, the Internet, but I haven't heard yet. Hmm. So uh, you were there for 12 years. Um, during those 12 years, um, how, how did you get convinced of the mythology that, that the church uh, exposes its followers to? Well, 
Well, the church closes its members off. It, you, it, when, when you're a member of the Church of Scientology, the higher you get, the increasingly deeper you, you walk into their bubble, uh, where you speak their language, you only talk with other people who speak their language, where they tell you what television shows you cannot watch, what radio shows you cannot listen to, what websites you cannot visit. You install software on your computer that filters out wow. anything anti-Scientology. And as new anti-Scientology sites uh, or expose sites appear, they are added to the no-no list. So you're all squirreled away in, in just, oh my God, we're saving the planet. We're the only ones who have the technology to save the planet. And it's dangerous. Really, right now, it could go up. We better get all your money. Really, right now. And so that's how they live. And that's how we lived. And I made it onto L. Ron Hubbard's personal ship. Right, you knew him. Yeah, yeah, we worked together. Uh, I was first mate on his ship, and uh, he and I worked together on public relations and marketing. Wow. You also um, got married uh, twice? Three times, Three times totally. Twice in Scientology and mm -hmm. once afterward, yes. And then you were, you had a daughter named Jessica. By my first marriage, yes. Mm. Uh, your daughter is estranged from you. And you. I understand you learned that you have grandchildren as well that you've never met. Uh, how does, once you left the church, how did the church then make you into a sort of a non-person or somebody that they have decided is, quote, fair game in their words? Um. For example, I worked with L. Ron Hubbard, and this is part in the book, my memoir. Uh, I gave L. Ron Hubbard the idea of how to use a specific kind of public relations tech uh, technology, and uh, he revised it to make it okay for church executives to scream it at their staff. It, it's complicated. But at the end of the tape, he had tape lectures. He's, he thanked Al Bornstein. And they've erased that part of the tape. Mm. They've taken my name off of all the uh, policy letters that I've written, programs that I've written. Uh, if you go into a Church of Scientology today, there's a drawer filled with um, bright yellow paper. And on each bright piece of bright yellow paper is the name of the, an enemy of the church and Al Bornstein's on one of those. Mm. And all of the people who've left the church, I presume? Yeah, pretty well. If you leave under circumstances like I left, like uh, n it wasn't condoned. How, how did you leave and what did you say when you left? Wow. When, what was the reason for your leaving? I the say. reason for the leaving was because I was one of the church's biggest salespeople and I was selling in Europe and this was before they had their fundraising craze. That's pretty much all they do now is raise money, donations. But this was, you know, you're buying services, you're buying courses, or you're buying spiritual counseling. And I was making up to 70000 U.S. dollars a week. Wow. Uh, and that was 1970s dollars. Yeah. yeah. And we were depositing all this money in a special account in a Swiss bank. And it was supposed to have nothing to do with the church or L. Ron Hubbard so that the money could be used you know, tax-wise. It was a laundry thing, and most, co most corporations have that. But then when I was making a deposit, uh, one of the vice presidents let it slip that it was, in fact, L. Ron Hubbard's account that the money was going directly into. And I thought I was uncovering this big conspiracy against L. Ron Hubbard, but it turned out to be true. <laughs> and when I found out that he was a crook, uh, I left. <laughs> Kate Bornstein, in your book, you have a theme running throughout your book, I Must Not Tell Lies, and you've tattooed it on the top of your hand, and I suppose Harry Potter fans know what that mean and your, means, and you refer to it in, in your book, but how, what does that, how does that relate to your experiences in, in your life? Why do you have that tattooed on your hand? There are so many of my identities that are associated with lying. I'm an actor. 
actors lie. We're really good at it. I am, according to the Church of Scientology, a suppressive person. Suppressive persons only tell lies, and they tell lies with the express purpose of destroying humanity in the Church of Scientology. I'm a salesperson. Salespeople always tell <laughs> lies. I'm a writer. Writers always tell lies. Um, so pretty much every path I've taken is marked by... The success is marked by how well you can lie. Hmm. Let's talk about um, what happened then after you left the church. You left the church and you began your transition into a, a woman, into you know Kate Bornstein, if you will. How that? How did that? Um, decision free you from a lifetime of wondering who you were? The first thing that freed me to make that decision was my father died and I no longer had the pressure to be the perfect son and that was a big burden off my shoulders and and you talk about your father a lot in the book about the kind of person he was yeah he was a macho guy uh he he grew up working the the silk mills in patterson new jersey put himself through college and medical school but but your mother was very liberal yeah yeah she was she she kept him in line. He liked to visualize, envision himself as Archie Bunker. Uh, if Archie Bunker had gotten a medical degree, that would be my father. Uh, I'd like Rip Torn to play him in the movie. And I think Rip Torn <laughs> should play L. Ron Hubbard in the same movie. Um, yeah. So, so, so you, your father passed away. And then uh, the, what, how, how did that then uh, become a turning point in your life into becoming Kate Bornstein? I realized there was nothing stopping me. There was nothing I was afraid of anymore. Most of my life I've been afraid. Uh, it started with being afraid to tell people I was a girl. Uh, and that when you're a little tiny kid, y- you live in constant fear. Um, fear became my default emotion. Uh, And when my father died, I wasn't afraid of him anymore, and I moved forward. Hmm. Uh, Going back to the Church of Scientology, the fact that you write about it is quite brave, because the Church is known for its litigiousness, for uh, not taking to critiques uh, by ex-members very kindly. Uh, What sort of community have you found online of ex-members? I found a wonderful community on the ex-Scientologist message board, and the community I most interact with is on the Village Voice blog um, presided over by editor-in-chief of the Village Voice, Tony Ortega. Real intelligent conversation and pulling apart what's going on with the church these days. Um, I also found an online community in Twitter, like 13,000 people uh like me enough to listen to my words and I go okay okay cool so if the church comes after me but they haven't see and that's interesting because this is the first book that but written by an ex-scientologist that's been published by a publishing company Beacon Press instead of self-published really yeah not since William S. Burroughs wrote his book in the 70s on Scientology uh, not not since then has there been a published book by by a publishing house Hmm. and we're here in Los Angeles and perhaps the heart of the Scientology Church. How did you skirt some of the uh, legal traps that you, or, you know, how did you decide how to describe the church's sayings and the church's, uh, you know, mythology, if you will? I notice in the book you do a lot of paraphrasing. I have to do that. Um, the my, my, my publisher's lawyers vetted the book, and any direct quotes came out. Um, I kept it I wanted to write about them and not be mean. I wanted to tell the truth, but I didn't want to be mean to them. So they didn't really have to correct that much. Um, There was a lot about that life that kept me alive for a long time. Hmm. And, And let me explore that just a little bit. What is it that the church gives members that they don't find elsewhere? And this is, I suppose, the same kind of question that can be asked of evangelical churches. Is it a kind of a family for people who feel like they don't have family or that they're lost looking for community? It gives 
people answers mm. and uh, an answer for everything. L. Ron Hubbard has an answer for everything. And you, ha- you live in a community of people who acknowledge and believe in the same answers. Uh, it's like any fundamentalist religion. Uh, it's like the mafia. Here are the answers. Here are the rules. This is good. This is evil. You agree with us. You're a member. Um, I grew up Jewish in valuing questions. Um, and so what I've tried to do with my own writing in gender is put in more questions than answers answers. I, 12 years of answers was enough for me. Hmm. Uh, and how do you feel um, the church's uh, views on gender, on gender identity, and on homosexuality, how do those reflect the sort of standard conservative views? Can you put the Church of Scientology in the same sort of pantheon of religious ideology that, that is conservative, um, particularly here in California, you know, ground zero, if you will, Prop 8 has has brought up so many issues, uh, even though the tide seems to be turning now. Well, uh, it was recently revealed that the Church of Scientology donated um, to some anti-gay legislation, uh, which is why Paul Haggis left, and there was that the wonderful... The filmmaker, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he was shocked that they would be that... Uh, homophobic and transphobic, but it is built in there because L. Ron Hubbard, that was his generation. He was born in like 1911, and um, people grew up with deep-rooted homophobia and transphobia in those days. My guest is Kate Bornstein. We're talking about her book, A Queer and Pleasant Danger. It's a memoir. It's also the true story of a nice Jewish boy who joins the Church of Scientology and leaves 12 years later to become the lovely lady she is today. And that lovely lady joins me in studio. You've got a number of uh, events uh, that I will mention to listeners in just a moment where you'll be promoting your book, a whole weekend of events here in Southern California. I want to ask you also about how your book is in in, um, in many ways very uh, directly a letter to your daughter and, uh, and, and your hope that you may one day reunite with her. Yeah. I want her to leave the church. Over the last 10 years, I've been discovering that they, it wasn't a church when I joined. It wasn't a religion. <laughs> they called themselves an applied religious philosophy. They're, and it became a religion for tax purposes. We all knew that. But nowadays, um, it has become a religion. People treat it like it's a religion. So I want her out of there. They there's documented proof of her terrible conditions, living conditions for staff. Uh, they have their own internal prison. They call the whole uh, the head of the church, David Miscavige. Uh, a dozen people, half a dozen at least, uh, have witnessed him beating staff members physically. Uh, it's not a place I want my daughter. I left her, I figured, okay, you're saving the planet, sweetie, that's good. Good for you, hooray. But they're mean. They, they, they have an internalized bully system in the Church of Scientology that rivals the bully system we have in the United States government. And she was born into this. Yeah, that's all she knows. Do you have a message for others who are considering joining the church or those who are in the church who who might be listening now? Yeah, anyone who's in the church who's listening now, get yourself to a public internet terminal. Google the word Scientology. Get a brand new book just released two days ago, three days ago, by Jefferson Hawkins um, on escaping and recovering from the Church of Scientology. Um, the most useful book I've ever read on for, for an ex-Scientologist. Mm. Well, uh, finally, Kate Bornstein, um, any words of advice also for uh, for, pe- for young people who are struggling with their own gender identity? You've lived a very full life, a very exciting life, as your book um, reveals. Um, you know, you've, you've also struggled a lot. You've struggled with health issues and a lot. I understand you, you're you currently struggling with a, a slow form of leukemia. Uh, it's not a struggle. It, you know, they... 
my bad blood has got me hands down. I'm not struggling. It's just got me. Hmm. And and you're just chugging along. And yeah. uh, w- what do you say to, to young folks who might be scared, who might feel trapped, who might feel trapped in their communities, who might not know how to manifest what's inside them freely, like you've learned to do in your adult life? <laughs> Here's what I've learned. I've learned how to make a life worth living in a world that would rather see me dead for who I am and what I love and who, how I love. Um, and my advice to anyone who's having a hard time or walking a hard road in identity, desire, or power is this. Do whatever it takes to make your life more worth living. Full stop. And the only rule you have to follow in order to make that work is don't be mean. Hmm. Good advice for a lot of folks. Uh, Kate Bornstein, it's a pleasure to have you in in here. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's a thrill to be on your show.